I uphold the law. The law means nothing to me. I've had no say in making the law. That's an excuse. It's all we have. We break windows. We burn things. Because war's the only language men listen to. Because you've beaten us and betrayed us and there's nothing else left. Then there's nothing left but to stop you. What are you going to do? Lock us all up? We're in every home. We're half the human race. You can't stop us all. You might lose your life before this is over. And we will win. And that's a clip from Suffragette starring... Kerry Mulligan, I'm delighted to say that the movie's writer, Abby Morgan, joins us. Hello, Abby, how are you? Hey, hi. I was going to say that you, it was screenwritten by Abby Morgan or written by... What's the Gosh, you know, screenplay? These things get written into your contract sometimes. You know, They say things like, would you like written by, created by, written and created by, screenwriter, screen, um, uh, screenplay. Um, I, just, I call myself a screenwriter just because I get really terrified that anyone will think I've written a novel when I really couldn't <laughs> write a novel. So um, I just say screenwriter. OK, so the screenwriting on Suffragette was done by Abby Morgan. I, I think m- a lot of people, when they go and see the film, will be amazed at the fact it seems to, unless I've missed it, taken so long mm. for this story mm. to get the big screen treatment. I mean, Mary Poppins aside, when was the last time the suffragettes got a big budget? Well, I mean, we, it, there's never been a film about the British um, suffragette movement. There has been some about the American suffragette movement, but not many. There's been one television piece in the early 80s called Shoulder to Shoulder, which examined the movement and the Pankhurst family, which was brilliant. Um but no, nothing else. And in fact, it, this was a love of Sarah Gavron's for about 10 years. She's the director. Yeah, yeah a director. And I'd, I've already worked with Sarah when I adapted Brit Lane um, several years ago now. And so we were looking for something else to do together. And so when she bought me that subject straight away, I, like you, I went, well, it's Mary Poppins, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's the wide-brimmed hats. It's the ladies with the long skirts and the tambourines. And actually the revelation for me was how contemporary the voices of these women felt and also just how shocking the kind of police intimidation of them was. Well, can you explain a bit more what you mean about how contemporary it's happened? Well, Sa- you know, Sarah had gathered together a body of research which we have built on throughout the, the course of um, the filmmaking. And in fact, we had a website which we started to download stuff because there was so much stuff that um, we found. But actually, it was, it was everything. It was from... Um, uh, the interviews with the women that were done um, in the newspapers post being arrested. It was the memoirs that, that were fascinating, written by Mrs. Pankhurst and Emily Wilding Davison and beyond. It was the police surveillance reports that weren't opened until 2002, 2003, where you would um, look at the kind of levels of intimidation, levels of surveillance, levels of arrest and incarcerations that these women experienced. And then it was the testimonials, of which there were many, which were written specifically when um, David Lloyd George at the time said, I will listen to your deputations, come and tell me about your working lives, and I will consider it when I consider giving you an amendment to get the vote. And so that's a key scene in the film where you see Maud talk about her working life. And it was when I started to read the stories of the working lives of these women and realised that all the things they were dealing with, which were things like pay equality, um, parental rights, sex abuse at the work at work and home, um, custodial rights, property rights, it felt very, very 21st century and very now. And they didn't sound like the archetypal sort of slightly down to nabby take of that world that I had seen before. Was it obvious that you, I mean, so you tell the story from the point of view of Maud, who's a mm. fictional character, a composite character, mm. uh, played by Kerry Mulligan, in amongst a lot mm. of people who, mm. who really existed. Was that obvious the way for you to tell the story or did you originally start from a, telling a biopic? Or No, I'm so embarrassed about how many drafts I did of this and how, how many? long it... I mean, honestly, full drafts, like 30 rewrites, probably another 15 on top. Why so many? Because I just couldn't get it right. I mean, I literally couldn't get it right. I couldn't. And I think I made the fatal mistake because I did exactly that. I went, oh, gosh, OK, the movement was run by the middle class and the upper class. So let's write the film from the perspective of Alice, which was the Romola Garai character in the film. And she is married to a Westminster MP. She's a woman of, of her own wealth. And we see her making speeches. We see her so, making yeah. speeches. She's sort of she's a charitable lady. And and as a real result, I created a character out of that called Maud, who was worked at the local laundry, ends up coming to work in the house. And then it felt very, very familiar. And running parallel with that, I started to read more and more about the working women. And there were some very important working women at the time. There was Hannah Mitchell, there was Annie Kenny, and these were women for, who came up and down the country and were really the foot soldiers of the movement and were the the acolytes of Mrs. Pankhurst. And I thought, this feels very now. And in fact, if you look at, you know, the Arab Spring and you look at um, Pussy Riot and you look at moments of of political change and you look at the modern day suffragette, they are not often the middle and upper classes. They're the working women. So that's what drew me back to finally finding the story of Maud. 
Is it possible, because obviously there weren't polls at the time, do we know, it sounds like a stupid question, do we know what most women felt? Do you even know whether most women wanted the vote? The oh. reason I ask is that Maud's character isn't suddenly supported by all her women. Good on you. you know, in no. fact, she's ostracised. No, I mean, one of the things that the women were, work, were fighting against and the, thing, the, the point where our film opens is the sense that these women have been peacefully protesting for 50 years and part of their frustration and part of their despair that leads them to advocate militant um, activism is the fact that they have been ignored in the press. And we see examples of this. They've been ridiculed in the press. There are a number of articles. The name suffragette was originally a derogative term used by the Evening Standard in the Daily Mail. And what a strange word it is. It anyway. is a very strange word. And um and then and then also there are there was public outcry. There was a very strong anti suffragette movement. There were you know they were seen as hysterical, they were seen as unfeminine, they were seen as mad. You know, they were seen as um, insane. I mean, there's the famous quote, which I'm yet to find, but I am told exists somewhere, which is Asquith compared, uh, who was the prime minister at the time, compared giving the vote was like giving the vote to a rabbit. I mean, that was the kind of level of thinking at that time. And you only need to look at the propaganda postcards that were sent around, which are really, some are very comical, some are deeply, deeply shocking. And the, the, the also the, the filmmaking that was going on at the time, there's a number of short films which shows, you know, the, the suffragette, the consequence of feminism and the, the suffragette uh, kind of of the anti-suffrage um, attitude you can see in those films. So, it, you know, these women were fighting against the society was, which was saying, we don't need the vote, we don't want the vote. So do you think that most women did want the vote? And no. that the reason that they didn't all line up behind Maud, it was, it was, yeah. this fictional character, is because they were scared? There is a scene where Maud takes her testimony, I talked about it before, where she takes her testimony to David Lloyd George and he says, and what will you, what will this vote mean, what will this vote mean for you? And she says, I never th even thought we'd get it, so I never thought to think what it would mean to me. And I think that's the point. I think that there was a huge Westminster chorus that was um, compounded and, and dialed up by the media at the time which was saying you don't want the vote think what the vote would mean the vote would mean that you would have to start taking decisions that would be terrifying you know the vote would mean that you would no longer see your families that would be terrifying the vote would mean that maybe you are more masculine than feminine do you really want to use your femininity so i would say there was a huge sway and i would say it was definitely over half um, I like to think it wasn't much more than that, but I would say it was probably half to about 70% who didn't want the vote. And it was this 30% that said, think what we could do if we got the vote. Do you think, did you come to the conclusion that the direct action, the militant action, mm. which you talk about, the bombs mm. and, the, uh, and the starting of fires in post boxes, did that bring the moment forward when mm. women got the vote? Or did it actually possibly postpone it and put people off? I think it did both. But I think... Ultimately, it pushed the movement forward. I think if you look at any um, repressive regime, which I think it, we were living in at that time, uh, certainly for women, um, uh, and you place yourself at the vanguard of change, then militant activism follows. And there are moments of violence. We've seen that in every great movement. And, and it was controversial you know, within within the suffrage movement. It was movement. incredibly controversial. I mean, there were, you know, and you, you have to think, you know, the things that they were doing. They were, you know, well, you know, the thing that was important was Mrs. Pankhurst said, we will not harm human life. So let us think how, how can we disrupt? How can we get publicity for our cause? So if we blow up pillar boxes, and there were four postal deliveries at that time, and that was affecting them because they communicated with each other via coded messages on postcards. And if we cut telegraph wires and if we burn down libraries and if we blow up buildings and set fire to churches, then those men in institutions will start to see how serious we, we feel and how, how, how le the level of our despair. And I really think it was only um, the death of one of their own in the form of Evelyn Wilding Davison that kind of exposed their despair to the world. And it was the starting point which I think made the world and more importantly the media go, we cannot let this go on. Really. And was it always going to be Meryl Streep? I'd written pages and pages for Meryl, so I thought we can't go to her with like what is effectively one speech. You know, she's had five or six speeches in Iron Lady, but it was really Carrie when Carrie came aboard, and, and it was Carrie saying, you know, this woman, you have to convey to an audience that this woman, her presence, her charisma is enough to make them do incredible things. And so I think we realised we needed an iconic actress for an iconic park. So it was it was Carrie who said, let's go to Meryl, and I was really nervous about it, and really nervous that she wouldn't accept it, really nervous it wouldn't be 
be big enough, really nervous of the consequences of it. Actually, what was amazing and what is amazing about having Meryl on this film, obviously it helps finance the film, which is really important because this is business and we have to show this film can sell in the box office, otherwise these films won't get made again. Films led by women, films written for women. But more than that, she's an incredible advocate in the industry. She's an amazing actress and she brings that to the part. But also she really can talk eloquently about the industry and, and, and the disparity in the industry for women. And that's great. On, on that subject, I mean, your movie opens the uh, the London Film yeah. Festival. The, the, only the third time in 59 years that a woman has written and produced and directed and largely started. Wow, yeah. Uh, I didn't in, know that. So that's in the good movie. To know. So when Kerry Mulligan talks about a sexist film industry, mm. do you go, yeah, absolutely, you're right? I, you know, I, I don't even need to say it. Look at okay. the statistics. I, I mean, it. you know, what's really exciting uh, is that we have 46 feature films directed by women in this film festival, which is amazing. And this is a film festival which has, has advocated for women and is looking for those films. It still only represents 19% of the films. It's the statistics. They add up, you know. And, and I think they add up again and again. So, um, uh, yes, you know, of course it's a sexist film industry. That's not to say that there aren't true feminists amongst the male producers I've worked with. And I think, you know, when I think about the term feminism, it's really, I can live with it really lightly because it's just equality. And I think most men and women want that, don't they? There's a striking title sequence at the end, the, the, as the Robin mm. credits, which gives the, uh, the date in various countries where uh, mm. right the votes for women uh, were granted. Uh, Mark would like me to say you missed out the Isle of Man because the Isle of Man actually gave it in 1881 and therefore should have been in there ahead of New Zealand. Sorry, I can just... only apologise. I tell you something, I, I saw a journalist yesterday and she was she was very lovely but she was she was very cross that I hadn't done Sweden. And also there is a dispute about whether Italy was 45 or 46. So. But most people will go, really, Switzerland, 1971? It's because they make good chocolate. You see, it leads you astray. You think nice, they make good chocolate, they must, give, they must give the vote. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, there were, there were constantly shocking moments. I mean, I think the thing that I find a little bit depressing is I wasn't shocked that Saudi Arabia was 2015. You know, women are registering to get their vote, and yeah. I wasn't shocked by that. But I am shocked, you know, I am shocked when I look at Switzerland, actually. We don't often speak to screenwriters on the programme, but can I take advantage of having an yeah, award-winning uh, screenwriter? We have many people who listening to the programme who are desperate to get involved in the industry in some way, direct movies, yeah. act in movies, um, write movies, mm. as someone who has written for television, written plays, and written very successful mm. movies. What advice would you pass on, ha mm. knowing what you know now... What should people um, do? I think you're living in an incredible age if you come into film and television now because I think there is such advocacy for it. I think we have so many ways in which we can watch those. I think there's such a thirst and hunger for it. I think when you see big actors, big directors moving from film into television, then you know it's a medium across the board that's being taken seriously and vice versa. Um, so I would say to anybody, um, you know, Hold on to the to your inner voice. Hold on to to what you think you want to write. Try and write it, but listen to your critics and use your champions and find them. Because you know, I think my career is being built on a very kind of um, a kind of quite tenuous but line of various men and women who really believed in me. And I, and that started probably with my mother and showing her my first thing and her going, yeah, it's good, keep going. And I and also the other thing I would say is don't talk it out, write it. Because the biggest kick every writer gets is saying, let me tell you what my film's about. And it really takes away the energy from writing. So if you're going to write, it really comes down to 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Sit down and do it. Just don't talk about it. And read the William Goldman book. Yeah, I think, you know, read it and then throw it across the room in frustration. I found that really helped me. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I did a, a year long writing course and um, I advocate them primarily because I think it allows you to give yourself a breather for a year. And to use the, set, the phrase, I'm a writer, which I think it takes a long time to fully own that phrase. Even now, I, you know, it's taken me time to feel comfortable and think someone's, you know, someone going to really question this. Can I really stay on and do this job? Am I going to be found out? Um so I think they're good for that, but but don't think it's the only way through, and and um, because it really, really isn't. And draw on your life experience because it can be a rich resource, certainly at the beginning, and then and then read as much as you can, and also take out every third line of dialogue because it will just give more air to the script. Do you know what you're working on next? Um, I'm a, I'm just about to start to adapt a book by um, called Ashley's War uh, by Gail Tamez Lemon, who is a journalist who was out in Afghanistan, and it is looking at a group of female soldiers who went out as cultural support in Afghanistan during the war to um, gain intelligence from Afghan women. So it's a very female-led and female-driven piece. Abby Morgan, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thanks so much.